Welcome. You're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Tuesday, September 1st, 2020. We're sharing local news and resources, focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have two interviews coming up today, and then next week I'll host Corinne Modakaitis about the impact of the pandemic on youth sports from her perspective as co-director of Davis Aqua Monsters. I'm going to catch up with some important statistics today. Yolo County reported 34 COVID-19 new cases yesterday, bringing the total number of county residents infected to 2,424, with 52 deaths countywide since the start of the pandemic. The county's online dashboard reports that 29 of those deaths have been in Woodland, 13 in West Sacramento, 9 in the unincorporated areas of the county, and 1 in Davis. Davis has now seen a total of 256 cases of COVID-19, and interestingly, more than half of them in individuals between the ages of 18 and 34. Statewide, California has seen just over 706,000 cases, 12,933 deaths, and, and listen to this, more than 11,373,000 residents have been tested, and there's a seven-day test positivity rate of 4.6%. In a graph on the Yolo County Department of Public Health, uh, I'm sorry, on the California Department of Public Health website, uh, Yolo County sits at about the halfway point on a list of counties and their case numbers, with Los Angeles County squarely at the top of the list. And nationally, folks, we've crossed the six million dollar six million dollar six million people mark of cases this week with 183,000 deaths. Those are some sobering statistics. Yesterday, in some good news, Yolo County began allowing salons and barbershops to resume indoor operations. We hope that's good news. While following state of California guidance, the county's face covering order and strict social distancing protocols. The state of California revealed on August 28th its new tiered framework titled Blueprint for a Safer Economy, which aims to reduce COVID-19 in the state, but also provides revised criteria for loosening and tightening restrictions on various activities. Every county in California is assigned to a tier. There are four, the most serious being widespread, and that's where Yellow County sits based on our rate of new cases and test positivity. At a minimum, counties must remain in a tier for at least three weeks before moving forward, and they must meet the next tier's criteria for two consecutive weeks. All right. Additionally, shopping malls, including indoor malls, destination shopping centers, strip and outlet malls, and swap meets, can also reopen in Yellow County, subject to the state's guidance. And finally, the Green Check Program is a new voluntary program from Yolo County that businesses can apply for to show they're in compliance with state and local guidance regarding COVID-19 and that public health and safety is a priority for them. Through this incentive program, businesses will need to fill out a simple application that says their establishment is COVID-19 compliant by implementing and following set protocols that include, but are not limited to, face covering requirements, proper signage and distribution, personnel training, hand washing and hand sanitizing guidelines, cleaning and disinfecting guidelines, measures to maintain social distancing and prevent unnecessary contact. So the program is self-monitoring. When I saw the news break online, it was the thing that a lot of people questioned. How will we know that they're actually compliant? It is self-monitoring, and I think for now we'll call it a good place to start because there are a lot of businesses out there trying their best. For all county news, please see yolocounty.org, and let's take a moment for music, and we'll be back with our first interview shortly. All right. My first guest today is Sarah Gavin. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist, as well as a licensed professional clinical counselor, and she serves as chief behavioral health officer at Communicare Health Centers, which means she oversees a 100-person team of mental health and substance use disorder services here in Yolo County. And she also sits on the board of directors of NAMI Yolo, which is the local chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Welcome, Sarah, and thanks so much for joining us today. 
Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I, I really want to say how glad I am you're here. There still seems to be a lot of secrecy and, and shame oftentimes around mental illness. And I'd, I'd really like to help towards work towards normalizing that. But let's start there. Why is it so difficult for people to address mental illness in the same way we address physical illness? Well, that's a complicated question to answer. And yeah. the stigma of mental illness and recovery and substance use uh, disorder services in that included um, has gone on for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And the more that we openly talk about it, um, whether we're seeking therapy ourselves, whether we have a family member who is, um, whether we support services, the more that we talk about it, the more that we bring to light that this is a normal part of health. Mm -hmm. um, the more integrated services that we see in primary care centers, um, any way that we can normalize seeking services as a part of wellness and the way we take care of ourselves, it directly addresses that effort. Yeah, I know. I realize it is a complicated question. I, I think there's something about the the American makeup, if you will, that we are supposed to be strong. We are supposed to be resilient. We're not supposed to fail at those things. And so I just sort of wonder how that plays into it. Absolutely. An individualistic um, approach and thinking that, uh, you know, that there's a, um, a romanticizing toughness yeah. um, and associating with getting help as something that is a sign of weakness when it absolutely isn't. It's one of the hardest things to do is to ask for help. It's one of the bravest things that someone can do. Right, right. So here we are. It's September 1st. We're almost six months into this pandemic. And, you know, what everyone is calling our new normal now has really wreaked considerable havoc on our, our social and our support systems, how we move through the world. And, uh, you know, I've read several articles and heard others talk about a concern that kind of the next wave of the pandemic is really about our collective mental health. And I, I think it's important to note, we're not just talking about the, the COVID pandemic, we're also talking about kind of unprecedented political unrest and social unrest. And so in, in I, I understand confidentiality applies to all your work, but in general terms, how are you seeing all of this play out among your patient population? What can you share with us? Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, absolutely, people are suffering. Uh, people were suffering before this, but we have uh, added multiple life stressors. And as you mentioned, uh, multiple public health crises. Right. You know, we have COVID. We have systemic racism that has gone on for a very long time. And then, of course, mental health. And the disruption of connection, mm -hmm. um, the way that we heal in lots of aspects of our life is through connecting. Right. And, uh, and this uh, transition um, has made it very difficult for people to connect, or at least change the way that people connect. And, you know, if, as a therapist, oftentimes, you know, we're saying when you're making changes in your life, make those things one um, step at a time, one change at a time. Mm -hmm. And for everybody managing, right, their entire life changed overnight. Right. Uh, it, you know, their job stability, their stressors, school closures, um, their health, the isolation, even things that are simple routines that they had um, in connecting with people are, it was disrupted. So it's a uh, tremendous change. And so you take people that are already struggling with mental health, um, and then you add a change in the way that they get service delivery, um, and you add changes in the way that they are isolated, and you add stressors. And then there are people that have never accessed mental health services before mm -hmm. that are experiencing mental health symptoms and increase in depression and anxiety, um, all the, you know, what what is understandable considering all the stressors and isolation is occurring. Yeah, and I, I talk about wanting to normalize this. I'm, I'm very transparent. I struggle with anxiety myself. I'm a really high-performing person, but I'll tell you that my anxiety has, has definitely spiked up during this time, and, and I do talk about it because I feel like it's important to for people to be able to say, oh, right, you know, I know you're, I recognize you're high functioning and yet you're acknowledging this. So I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, more and more of us can, can do that to help normalize it. So every business and organization, every single one, we've all had to pivot during this time. I'm really wondering how, as counselors and therapists, you were able to work with clients during this pandemic. How, how does that work? Yeah, so at Communicare specifically, we continue to offer in-person in services um, because we are seeing that the um, services, some of the services have to happen in person and are essential. And then if they can happen via telehealth, that's, that's what we're doing, mm -hmm. so offering video um, and phone visits in lieu of in-person, if that makes sense clinically. Yes. There are reasons that people need to come in um, and uh, 
um, and certainly with mental health concerns and the consequences for untreated mental health and substance use, we definitely want to make sure that there is precautions. And, and, and NAMI has done the same thing, is they're pivoting to create uh, avenues for support via telehealth and have moved their um, family support group, as an example, over Zoom mm-hmm. um, to engage people that way. Um, as well as there's some self-guided courses that NAMI is offering um, for education and um, basic information um, for people to access during this time. Oh, good. But it was a huge change for the workforce providing the services as well. I, I can imagine. So, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you started heading uh, off into to what uh, NAMI YOLO does. So let me just read this. The YOLO County, California chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, is a grassroots self-help support and advocacy nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the lives of people with psychiatric disorders, including schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, clinical depression, panic disorder, uh, obsessive compulsive do- disorder and severe emotional disorders in children. So you mentioned how how uh, Nami is also, and that that's a lot. That's a very heavy load. I just mentioned. I want to take a pause <laughs> and and take a second to acknowledge that um, I have not accessed Nami's services myself, but I have friends and family who who have, and who report that uh, some of the family classes, for example, were really. Uh, instrumental in in keeping them whole and well during a very difficult time that a family member was um, experiencing. So can we can we talk about those family classes for just a moment? Absolutely. So the the family support groups are designed for relatives for people that are um, experiencing mental illness. Right. So much of someone's recovery is about the support of people around them. And people that are family members are impacted, certainly, whether it's not themselves that are experiencing it, but they are um, a part of the system and definitely feel stressors and need support and practical skills and mm-hmm. being able to support their loved ones. So that is a really important uh, service that NAMI provides, and it is now available via Zoom. And so that's the first and third Tuesdays in the evening at 6.30 and okay. the second and fourth Sundays at 1.30. Okay. And I know there are a variety of other, you know, support groups and, and other services that, that NAMI YOLO provides. So I want to make sure people have uh, the website is namiyolo.org. And I want to underscore that, again, this is a largely um, volunteer run effort uh, done by, you know, volunteers and, and advocates. So um, you may not get a, 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 you know, an immediate response, but they will get back to you. All right. I'm and addressing your question about stigma. I mm-hmm. mean, NAMI is beautiful as an organization that the people that are a part of it are people with lived experience in recovery yes. and yeah. demonstrating that recovery is possible. Right. So it's it's going to be not only a compassionate place, but a place where people really get it. They they understand whatever it is that you're going through, most likely. So I'm wondering more broadly, Sarah, if we could talk about some strategies that all of us could use at this time to take good care of our mental health. We all, regardless of circumstance, just have an awful lot coming with it. We didn't even mention the fires earlier right. <laughs> among right. the list of things we're coping with. So uh, how, how, can we, uh, how can we tend to our, our, our own mental health? Yeah, so I mean, first, a starting point for everything is to acknowledge the loss and the suffering and change. I think many of us, um, as, a, as a stress response, as a response to this rapid change and crisis, were white-knuckling it, hoping that the, you know, the storm would pass and, uh, and not taking a moment to acknowledge all that has changed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I always encourage people to start there, um, which is often the most difficult. Right? People want to move to solutions and want to feel better, um, but just acknowledging that in ourselves. And then, and then, of course, the basics of health, which is, you know, nutrition and exercise and sleeping and water. And I know that many people are engaging in meditation and using apps for the very first time mm-hmm. um, and being able to, um, to learn skills and being able to calm, so, you know, our stress response that is activated sometimes daily. Um, and looking for ways to connect. I mean, connect, you know, healing happens with connection. And so... Uh, I just strongly encourage people to figure out ways that they can reach out to people that they haven't heard from um, or or look at ways that they can connect in a really creative way. I've heard so many creative ways that people are connecting hmm. um, via Zoom or meeting in parks or um, any way that people can fill their cup and rejuvenate. 
Yeah, I I had a, a moment last week. I uh, was invited to speak at a very small and very appropriately socially distant event at a local business. And, and I went and all of that was in place, but I couldn't get over how good it was to see people in what I describe as 3D. You know, I, I spend a lot of time, I run a, a media and tech organization, I spend a lot of time on Zoom in that 2D interface. And wow, seeing people in the flesh really did something for me, it really lifted my spirits. It's healing. Yeah. And we, we don't get that over virtual platforms. We get yeah. something, but we don't get the feeling of being in the presence of other people. Right. And on that note, in our last couple of minutes, I've, I've really been thinking a lot about uh, the kids doing school remotely. My, my kids are in college, so I'm, I'm past that phase. But, um, you know, and the parents who are home uh, man- trying to manage their own workloads in many cases and then trying to be there as a resource for, for their kids. And then the teachers and the, and the school staff and the support, I think they have a particular burden on them at this time. Absolutely. And I'm, and I'm one of those people, yeah. and so managing all that. And I, it, it reminds me of this great quote that's come out through COVID that um, we may all be in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. Right. And even in, you know, my circumstance there, you know, I'm, you know, privileged um, in many ways. And so there are people that are working multiple jobs and having stress of, you know, their kids, you know, doing distance learning and not having resources and all the other stresses that they're experiencing. So the more we can have grace, one another. <laughs> right. And I would imagine the, the same, uh, you know, kind of care guidelines you outlined a few minutes ago apply equally when we're thinking about our kids. We need to make sure mm-hmm. they move. We need to make sure yeah. they, they have some kind of social interaction because that's so important for their development right now. And Absolutely. we need to make sure that they, to the great ex- extent we can pull it off, that they have really good, healthy food to eat. So yeah. any final thoughts before we conclude here. Anything I didn't ask that you would like us to know? I just wanted to also say um, that in Davis, you know, Communicare runs a mental health navigation center, Mm -hmm. which is a drop-in. Someone can walk in in person or they can call um, to help navigate how to access mental health resources. It can be sometimes complicated and how to get help. And so it's just a great resource in Davis for people trying to figure out what the next steps are um, to getting services. Okay, and do you have a website for Communicare so we can leave folks with that? Yes, communicarehc.org. Communicarehc.org. Okay, Ms. Sarah Gavin, thank you so much for making time to talk with us today. I had a lot of people respond on Facebook that this is an important topic to them and they wanted to hear more. So thank you for helping me, um, you know, discuss it and, and, and let's continue working towards normalization of, of mental illness. Appreciate yes, your time. thank you. Yeah, thank you for elevating this topic. All right. Take good care. Bye. Bye. All right, folks, that was Sarah Gavin from Communicare, and I really appreciated her words and her insight at this time. We are going to take a moment for music and come back with our second interview. Thanks. Okay, I am delighted to welcome my second guest today, Melanie Carr. Melanie is a Davis resident who's been coordinating the Tuesday table since the early days of the pandemic, and she's here to talk about what she does. Welcome to you. Thank you. So I've seen your post on the uh, uh, COVID res- COVID-19 YOLO response group on Facebook. I've been watching him for months. Finally decided I, I really want to know more about what you do. So what's, what is the Tuesday table? So the Tuesday table is an opportunity to reach out um, to your neighbors, uh, to give and receive from them, and really it's to help out anyone who has a tough time financially. Mm -hmm. Um, We set up our tables outside our house, um, usually on our driveway or sidewalk, and then um, people come by uh, throughout the day to pick up um, canned goods, non-perishable items, Mm -hmm. as well as some fresh food and um, produce. We have locations in... um, uh, I think four or five locations in Davis and two in Woodland uh, that um, makes up Yolo County. So is this part of a larger effort um, or is this unique to you started it or helped start it here in Yolo County? Yeah, um, the person who started was uh, Catherine McMullen and she started it on Cinco de Mayo, mm-hmm. Mayo of this year. 
and um, it is uh, part of a larger movement. Well, she started the movement, and then um, I saw her post early on and was like 100% in because I really wanted to um, give back to the community. And then I think the, as the more uh, the word gets out, I think more people are who are able to help out either start their own tables or donate or do um, contribute to the effort. So uh, we even have a table that's as far away as the UK. So the word has gotten hmm. out a little bit. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. So uh, as I said, I've been watching your post for, for months now and um, you post lovely pictures of what's available that day. And I noticed today you were excited to say that someone had donated fresh eggs and fresh butter. And so the, those are really kind of these days, those are kind of high ticket items. They're, they're hard to afford if you're on a lean budget. So that's very cool. Um, and, and the pictures you posted are beautiful. There was a variety of fresh food. There was bread, there was canned goods, there was all kinds of stuff. So a wonderful outpouring of generosity. Um, how can people donate? I did also notice you were calling for additional support and donations. So how can we do that? Yeah, um, so we accept uh, donations. Uh, you can bring, it, it depends on which, you know, area you are in, mm -hmm. in Davis or Woodland, but you can always donate to me or, you know, the local uh, Tuesday Table. And um, we have a Facebook page that's called Tuesday Table, and um, you can go there. And we accept store-bought as well as homegrown and homemade items. Okay. Uh, we, dis we discourage dropping off right at the table because during COVID we don't want there to be so many people touching things. So um, we'll, we'll usually have porch pickup uh, the weekend before or if, okay. it's, um, if it's perishable like the day before just to um, minimize contact with other people. Right. And, yeah, you, con you can contact us or contact me, and then we arrange the drop-off, and then they go out on the table and people pick them up. So if someone had an abundance of tomatoes, for example, they would be welcome to drop off a box or call for porch pickup, and and you would you would welcome that kind of donation. Oh yeah, we would love that. Okay. We would love that. All right. So, can you share with us a little bit about how this has been responded? And I'm wondering if it's if it's actually kind of deepened your own sense of community through doing this, because I, I heard that that you wanted to give back, you wanted to be involved. Yeah, um, the response has been really positive. Um, typically, our items are gone within, you know, a couple hours of opening, and so it really demonstrates that there is a need there. Yeah. Um, and and as you said, you heard about it from uh, heard about us from the COVID nineteen Yolo community response. I think that's like one of the websites that's really gotten the word out um, because a lot of people really uh, focus on that website, and uh, I think it's enabled us to reach a larger audience. Definitely. Um, we've also had a lot of yeah, we've also had a lot of donors um, from Hope's Anchor, uh, nonprofit Cloverleaf Farms, UCD Family Groups, um, and, as well as others. And then, but for the most part, it's been neighbors. Like people are just like, "Hey, I've got these items. Can I drop them off at your house?" And then, then we say, "Yeah." And it's really great. It, it uh, you had mentioned that you know has it deepened my sense of community? And it really has. I've gotten to know a lot more people and um, people just seem so willing to help and you know in this time where it's just kind of like oh a pandemic and oh there's smoke and all this kind of stuff it's, yeah. there's this positive um, aspect to it that everyone I think really uh, holds on to and cherishes. Definitely I, I think we're all really hungry for that that sense of connection and something to lift us up because it, it, I just you know my first interview today was talking about mental health during the pandemic and it, it's pretty heavy there's a lot sitting on all of our shoulders so I want to thank you for you know for what you're doing for being consistent with the effort and for reaching out to involve others I'm really glad I learned about it. Even at that, I didn't know about the uh, the Tuesday Table page on Facebook, so you can bet that I'm going to go and, and like that and figure out a way to contribute as well. So um, anything else about how people can reach you or, or if you're looking for anything in, in particular in the weeks to come? Um, yeah, uh, well, I think Tuesday Table is a great way to contact um, contact us. And, you know, honestly, people just, um, Melanie Carr is my name, and people just contact me and I kind of, <laughs> you know, figure out the right spot for them to donate to, or, you know, people can always drop it off at my house. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this effort. And I think every, uh, a lot of other people are too. And um, I'm really excited to see how it moves forward and develops and, you know, how people also, you know, take it as their own and, and move forward. It's really great. 
Well, thanks so much for coming on to, to share that news with us. And, uh, and I hope that, you know, it's able to be sustained and, and carried forward. I appreciate your, your efforts at building community in that way. Oh, great. Well, thank, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. You bet. Take good care, Melanie. Okay, you too. All right. I firmly believe after you talk about some difficult things, it's really important to have a a warm fuzzy, something you can feel good about. So thank you to Melanie Carr and Tuesday Table for that. I have one last announcement for the day. It's just a reminder that an OptumServe COVID-19 testing site uh, runs through September 20th at the Davis Senior Center, which is 646 A Street in Davis. Um, apparently when they first opened, there was a line around the block and they've kind of sorted through um, all of that and have people moving through at a regular pace now. So if you've heard that, rest easy. Testing at this site is open to all California residents. This is important regardless of documentation status and is available by appointment only. And all ages are welcome. You can get tested there if you have health insurance. You can get tested there if you don't. Um, They will work it out for you to schedule an appointment. Call 888-634-1123 or visit lhi.care slash COVID testing. I want to thank you for tuning in. We're coming up on the six-month mark of this show, and you've been listening to the COVID-19 Community Report. I'm Autumn Lebe-Renault, signing off till next week. Take care.